information about the CAPO campaign that we have going on right now to keep and pull the library, which is why we have all these fans going. But if anyone has any trouble hearing during Jed's presentation, feel free to let me know and I can turn some of the fans off. So I'll now introduce Rena. Thank you. And before I begin, I want to thank Maeve and Meg from the library and give a couple of notes about Bookstock. Bookstock is totally volunteer run and free to the public. Bookstock is supported in part by the following organizations whose generosity has made it possible to offer Bookstock without charge. The Jack and Dorothy Byrne Foundation, the Pauline Davenport Children's Fund for the Vermont Community Foundation, the Vermont Humanities Council, and the Woodstock Learning Lab. I also want to give a special thanks to our media sponsor, the Vermont Standard, WCTV8, Woodstock Community Television, for taping all author sessions, Vermont's oldest independent bookstore, the Yankee Bookshop, and Sustainable Woodstock. Bookstock operates on grants, local generosity, and donations. If you want to donate, you can use your credit card online or drop something in the donation containers on the green. It will be greatly appreciated. It is now my pleasure to introduce James E. Dobson. His first book, Modernity and Autobiography in 19th Century America, Literary Representations of Communication and Transportation Technologies, came out in 2017 and established Professor Dobson as an important new voice. The newest book he's written that just came out a few days ago takes on the code that took Apollo 11 to the moon. This book is called Moonbit, and I urge everyone to look for it. Full disclosure, I am his co-author on this one. Earlier this year, his book, Critical Digital Humanities, The Search for a Methodology, appeared on the scene to significant praise. In this book, he takes on a pressing question. Can established humanities methods coexist with computational thinking? The Yankee Bookshop is selling copies downstairs, and I urge everyone to take a look. Dobson teaches at Dartmouth College and is presently completing, completing a book manuscript on the history of computer vision algorithms and their applications. Please welcome James E. Dobson. Right. Thank you very much, Rena. Uh, the, the topics for my presentation today, big data, machine learning, and computation um, are everywhere in contemporary life. These developments and technologies are changing many industries and uh, in many fields. Many of these, we, we think of them as rather disruptive technologies, have improved our lives immeasurably. Others have caused injury, produced misrepresentations, and re-embedded prior biases under the guise of uh, corrected objectivity for uh, formerly discredited human subjectivity. My academic work, which this, this book uh, is a, a part of, uh, sits at the intersection of the humanities and computation. My first career was in the computer industry. I spent my time developing complex computational solutions to a variety of problems. Those solutions usually involve the, the wholesale replacement, uh, displacement, forklift, uh, substitution of uh, prior systems, prior procedures, software, hardware, this kind of stuff. I stayed in, in the field and in, uh, in the computer industry long enough uh, to watch my own work become obsolete. I went back to school at that point um, and uh, started to study uh, the humanities and literary studies in particular because I saw in the humanities a different value system at work in those fields. The term legacy within, within technology, within the computer industry, legacy is a dirty word. We replace legacy systems, we um, uh, uh, remove them all the, all the time. Um, in the humanities, legacies, on the other hand, are not something to be, uh, to be removed, to be gotten rid of, but something that we need to uh, recover, something we need to critique, of course, as well, um, but more importantly, perhaps, protect. Uh, the, the literary legacy is something worth continually engaging with, right, is the argument that literary scholars and readers make all the time. Humanists, scholars working with the humanities, I'm going to argue, have a special obligation to the past, the past 
Uh, I guess I have to turn this thing back on. Uh, we treat the past as something to be taken seriously, um, something that's never really truly passed in the humanities, right? The, the past is always with us. That, that doesn't mean the past is confined to, uh, to history. Think of how reading always takes in the present, right? When you read a, a novel or a book uh, of any kind, uh, a, a play, for example, and you use the present tense verb always to describe the action of a character, right? There's a way in which in the the humanities, this, uh, the, the, the recognition that, that history is with us constantly, right? You're reading Hamlet. Hamlet is always performing an action in the, in the present. Uh, that's how we, we teach and think. So today in my talk, um, I want to bring together the resource of humanistic scholarship, literary studies, the kind of work um, that we, we might be familiar with in a context like this in book stock, and computational methods. Uh, to talk about the problems created when we do that, when we put computation, we put big data, all of these uh, buzzwords that you may be uh, hearing about or thinking about in some way, uh, together to think about the problems of that and then also the, the opportunities. And there, I'm going to provide a couple of examples of this. Uh, my primary object of critique, the thing I want to talk about today, is something called the bestseller code. Um, this is a, a book stock we're interested in thinking about books, about uh, publication, um, about presses, right, reading culture. And I, I think this example of this, this uh, recent book on using computational methods to determine if a book might be a potential bestseller or not is a, is a great object to, to think about and think with uh, for some of these problems. So my book, um, Critical Digital Humanities, this is it here, uh, Search for Methodology, is published by you know, Academic Press, University of Illinois, um, earlier this year. I wrote in here, the alluring promise of the use of large-scale computational methods for the humanities have enabled many literary critics to assert that it's now possible to deploy entirely new ways of reading, and that these approaches have obsoleted the slow, interpretive, and critical work associated with most humanities. Uh, scholarship. These computational tools, however, are not transparent, nor are they value-free. Computational methods bring with them an entire set of assumptions and concepts derived from the empirical sciences that may or may not be antithetic to the, the goals of humanities research, including, just to name a few, falsifiability, sampling, statistical significance, the notion of semantic meaning embedded in many of these tools. The incorporation of digital methods into humanities research requires more methodological awareness and self-critique. This is a manifesto, if you will, for my book and for thinking about this stuff and these kinds of, of problems, right? Um, are, are we, when we turn to using algorithms and computers to look at text to make um, assessments of text, like is this thing going to be a bestseller or just another dud in the literary marketplace, right? Um, um, are those tools uh, claiming to have um, an objective view or, or not is a, is a serious problem. Um, I think many of them are making those claims and uh, I want to examine those and, and think about this a bit more. I want to break down the steps involved in this kind of work and look at some of the, the steps involved. So I'm going to go through the ways in which something like that's put together. This is what my book does is examines uh, critically how one looks at large archives of texts um, in, a, in an automated way and how one can look at those who are doing this with computational methods critically. So let's talk a little bit about books, right? Something that should be a uh, pressing conversation for us here at, at Bookstock. Everything's changing right now with how we encounter books, how we deal with literary culture, um, how we find out about new things to read. We're, we're undergoing a massive shift across culture, right? I mean, the, the stuff I'm talking about here applies to music, right? It applies uh, to uh, many, many different forms of culture, movies, right? Beyond just, uh, just books. I'm, I'm going to be mostly interested in books for the sake of uh, our, our present context here. But um, just take a simple thing, right? How, how do you learn about new books, right? We can turn to our friends, right? Ask our friends for advice. What are you reading? What do you recommend? I would go to libraries, if I find public library like this one, and see book displays, uh, get recommendations from librarians. All right, we can go to a bookstore. We can look at the brand new books that are coming out uh, that have just been released. Uh, we can look at bestseller lists, those lists uh, produced and shared by places like the New York Times um, or, or other venues that report on uh, bestsellers. 
we can look at uh, the critical review. If we read something like the London Review of Books or uh, New York um, as well, um, you can get an extended um, analysis maybe of, uh, of a book, uh, a reading that puts a, a particular book that you might be interested in, a new novel in relation to its genre and to like social movements that might be happening at the present time. And increasingly the algorithmic recommendation. You're familiar with the algorithmic recommendation of course from Netflix uh, maybe or from Amazon when you go on and you look at Amazon if you use um, uh, Amazon's interface, right? You'll get recommendations for uh, books that you might be interested in based on books that you've read, based on books that uh, people who have purchased or read those uh, similar books may have looked at as well. This is a really interesting moment, right? This marks like a shift in um, sort of the expert provided recommendation, right? The, um, right, right now, I, I think we're, we're seeing this like cultural shift, right? In, in expert opinion versus the, the shift to like uh, mass opinion of, of what people think. There's both like good and bad aspects of the democratization of like taste and recommendations. Uh, if we go from like London review of, of books to uh, this, this Amazon produced list of recommendations, Right, we're we're getting something that uh, appears more more natural, coming from the like tastes of uh, everyday readers, grabbing onto maybe different aspects of people's reading habits. No longer just maybe a like high and low culture divide. This is something that's that's at work in this um, in this move away from the top down dissemination of uh, of opinions and critiques to this uh, more democratic uh, system. All of this is taking place in uh, what we could call like the, the big data revolution. Um, this is what, what I mentioned, right, that is changing uh, many, many ways in which we make decisions and which we think about uh, what parts of culture to access, what kinds of culture gets produced. Uh, Netflix has all kinds of research that goes into uh, what TV shows they will write. It's not just which TV shows uh, Netflix will green light, but which ones they will go and find a screenwriter to produce. Uh, based on uh, the uh, data produced from uh, lar large scale viewing um, archives of, of data from this. So we're seeing these big data, uh, big data derived decisions coming into many aspects of uh, everyday life. Insurance. You're, whether you're getting insurance or not, you're able to purchase insurance is increasingly coming from big data recommendations. Uh, things like um, uh, banking, if you're going to be able to, let's say, look, uh, get a home loan, right? If, what kind of rate you're going to get, this will be coming from large-scale analysis of data of uh, your, your purchasing habits, your uh, saving habits, um, all of those things. And of course, the recommendation engines, the Netflixes and, and the Amazon, right? This is from uh, the, the accumulated history of um, uh, of decisions made in the past, of uh, predictive uh, takes on what you might do in the future. So these algorithms, I'm saying they're varying in terms of um, what we supply as pre-existing uh, knowledge. And these, there's two big models I'll, I'll talk about here, supervised and, and unsupervised um, models and, and how we go about collecting data and processing data and thinking about it. Uh, th this has led to many people proposing that all the, all the, like, the work of having complex theories about in particular human behavior should be, it should be thrown out in, entirely, that in the big data world, uh, we no longer need to have theories about anything because we can collect data and make, uh, make decisions about stuff. So Chris Anderson, uh, I apologize for the small print here, he's the editor of Wired Magazine. In 2008, he made this, uh, this big uh, bold claim about how big data was going to change theories. He says this is a world where massive amounts of data and applied mathematics replace every other tool that might be brought to bear. Out of every theory of human behavior from linguistics to sociology, forget taxonomy, ontology, and psychology. Who knows why people do what they do? The point is they do it and we can track and measure it with unprecedented fidelity. With enough data, the numbers speak for themselves. That last bit, the numbers speak for themselves, is kind of the, the mantra of all of this stuff, right? Uh, we no longer need to have expert opinions. We can look at what people are purchasing and make decisions uh, based on that. We don't need to ask why someone's doing something. We just notice that they've done something or that people surrounding them have done stuff and that's 
good enough for this kind of stuff. Obviously, this, uh, there, there's many problems with uh, these assumptions and, and attitudes, um, biases that are getting baked in this, right? Numbers never just speak for themselves. Numbers don't exist outside of any uh, cultural frame for this. So let's dive into thinking about books and how we get information about books, how we turn books and book buying decisions and, and things uh, related to literary reading culture into data, right? How, how these numbers that supposedly speak for themselves get produced. Uh, when I think about this stuff in particular with like these um, uh, recommendation engines that tell us what we should be looking at, right? That tell us now how we learn about new things. I, I like to categorize or break this stuff down into a couple of different uh, categories of how we learn about books. We learn about books from metadata, which is uh, traditional familiar to us here in a public library, for instance, right? Um, we, we get like author, publisher, the year published, uh, the genre, all the stuff that's traditionally gone to like a library catalog. Then we can move to these object relations, which is Netflix telling you, this is what other people have viewed about this. So this is more about uh, who liked this other object, what else was purchased by this person, or what else was read by that particular person. Um, and then, um, what was purchased by people similar to those who purchased this book? So we're like linking together human relations, right? And your likes and dislikes and preferences uh, based on object relations, right? The book's at the center of that. And then there's this move, and this is really the, the center of my um, uh, critical work, right? Is on the, the text as data. So extracting from a novel, let's say, from a memoir, data features that can then be used to categorize um, an object in some way. Uh, so we, we move from um, information about an object, right, then preferences around an object, how we interact with it, uh, to the, the text itself as data, as producing the numbers, and I'll dive into that now. Uh, so again, a couple of key words that will guide everything I'm going to talk about for the, the remainder of my presentation, right? Algorithms and, and features here, two categories that we can uh, think about. Algorithms is, is used right, widely. We're familiar with the talk of big data algorithms, um, the algorithm deciding this or that, which road you're going to take on your drive home if you're using a map provided by uh, your GPS-enabled smartphone. So it's used for the, the complex stuff, um, as well as uh, systems in themselves, right? So we should be thinking a little critically about um, how these decisions are made uh, that, that uh, will tell us that, oh, this friend who liked this thing or the text of this book uh, will tell us something important. It, it's the decision-making mechanism is the algorithms in my analysis here of this. Um, and features are of some kind, textual features in, in the case of what I'm talking about now, are uh, the basis for that decision, right? How, how is that decision making taking place? What is it operating on? So those could be things like some of this metadata, right? How long a novel is, uh, the gender of the author, um, the genres, the, these are all features that we can choose from and select. So when we go into trying to automatically determine whether a book is going to be a bestseller or not, um, we, we have to go to that, that third part I, I was talking about with the selection of, of data because particularly with a brand new text, we don't know a lot about it with like a manuscript. And if you want to determine whether a book will be a bestseller or not, um, you need to operate on the text itself. So when we talk about converting a text into data, what we essentially mean is counting words and producing sets of features from those words. So this is the, um, one of the opening pages to one of my favorite memoirs from 1889, Lucy Larkham's A New England Girlhood. You just take this paragraph of text and count the words and their repetitions. We produce this uh, listing of words and repetitions of those words. This is the basics of how all this big data stuff with text happens which is all very interesting, but uh, all very problematic at the same time. Um, we can ask like, what we're learning when we see that like half repeats three times, right? This is a, a question and a site for investigation. We, we notice perhaps that sometimes a word that's used multiple times on the same page might be used in different ways. So we can add additional features to that by saying, well, what kind of word is that? And in this particular context, what is the part of speech 
is this word um, a noun? Um, has this word shifted suddenly um, and taken on a, a different meaning in this different context? Has it become a, an adjective, let's say? So there's ways of doing this automatically. These libraries uh, have built up digital libraries. This one called uh, Hathi Trust in particular um, has done this with all kinds of brand new texts even, produced uh, lists that tell us what kind of words we're looking at. And we can learn a number of things from this. Right, words that appear together, commonly used words. When you go to Amazon, you're trying to learn what a book might be about, you're gonna get uh, a, a list sometimes of frequently and infrequently used terms. These give us some sense of this book, right? Lucy Larkham's a, a memoir, it's an autobiography of her childhood uh, from late 19th century. We learn it's about New England. We learn who some of the major characters are. Uh, we learn a little bit about what it may concern in terms of the content, uh, young women, the Lowell Offering. Lowell Offering was the name of a magazine produced by young women who worked in the mills of Massachusetts where Lucy Larkham herself worked um, as a child. So we can learn something from an individual text from this by counting words, right, and counting phrases and building up features from that. And once we have those, what, what do we do with that? We can start to classify these things and figure out. So if we, we want to start from like the bottom level of just words, right, and the content of a text, um, we, we can build up higher level features to then uh, classify these. If we want to automatically know, like, like Netflix, again, I'm going to go, go to this example, where it gives you all these subgenres that you may have never heard of before. A lot of those are algorithmically derived, right, a, a genre that uh, makes, makes no sense outside of the, the context of a handful of films or TV shows about that particular thing. So this is one way of doing that, is to use classification algorithms, machine learning techniques that then take these features and try to categorize them, words as features, right? Taking the, the numbers of the repetitions of distinct words or phrases, and then using those uh, taking together to determine what class or genre maybe um, a, a book might belong to. So we can use these to, to build up feature sets. I'm going to gloss this by looking at flowers. Flowers are uh, kind of the origin story of a lot of classification of this machine learning stuff. In 1936, a statistician, uh, Ronald A. Fisher, published an article in the, uh, the uh, journal on eugenics. He was a eugenicist, a, a, a statistician who worked on that. A, a lot of uh, a stuff relating to data and computational methods has its, uh, its origins in all sorts of uh, uh, very problematic and nasty uh, political um, uh, work as the, the origins of this stuff. So at any rate, Ronald Fisher wanted to think about how one could look at some flowers irises, three different kinds of irises, and he noticed that you could categorize them based on some features of the flowers. I grow irises myself, uh, pick them up off the side of the road and plant them in my uh, backyard. I actually have no clue what kind they are, could probably use his algorithm to determine that or his method of selection um, for this. But he noticed that you could take these three uh, kinds of iris flowers and categorize them based on uh, two, two features, the, the petal length and width, and the sepal length and width, uh, length and, width. Um, and by taking these measurements across uh, a number of samples, you could, with, with pretty decent accuracy, uh, determine what kind of flower you're looking at, just base, based on these observations or measurements. He invented this world of, uh, of classification that we're, we're dealing with now, and this is the results of uh, this, this tool, this classification algorithm running on uh, this, this iris um, flower data set. It separates into these different regions, this uh, reddish, bluish, and greenish uh, region, these different samples of flowers. You notice how they're not all exactly the same, but they're kind of close enough and clustered together. So we can determine what we're looking at, what kind of uh, iris uh, based on these, these features. So this is the, those are the foundations of um, all this machine learning stuff in, in big data. And I'm going to move from flowers to something uh, a little bit more concrete for us thinking about texts. So we can take a class, right? No longer trying to identify different kinds of flowers, but we want to know 
about what genre, uh, sorry, what, what period a text might belong to. Um, I work in literary studies. Uh, I'm an Americanist. American literature is usually broken up when we take in the, uh, the, the whole history of American literature from the 16th century to the present. We have a really big divide in the 19th century. It's kind of foundational to thinking about American literature. It was the Civil War. The Civil War is a huge cultural event. Um, ha has been like taken up into literary studies to say there's a distinct difference between those books produced, uh, written before and after the Civil War, right? the antebellum and postbellum, particularly in that, that like 19th century moment, but um, things rapidly pick up following 1865. It, it's kind of somewhat arbitrary, maybe when we deal with text, and we can ask some questions about that. Now, if we just take word counts, and then we take this notion of uh, classification based on uh, lengths of the, the, the flower features in the iris flowers. We can uh, go to a bunch of texts. I've been working on uh, slave narratives. I find these fascinating. I think it's an important politically, um, for me, object to work on. Uh, there, there's a whole bunch of these unread uh, narratives and uh, by trying to bring them into my analysis and, and think about that in some way, I'm uh, shining a little bit of light on these texts. Um, so I take, and they, they've been digitized, the University of North Carolina uh, produced this great archive um, of North American slave narratives. Uh, there's around 165 of them, all mostly all first person narratives of people's experiences, enslaved people's experiences, both before and after the Civil War. And I thought this would be a fun test to go and look at. What can you do in terms of classification? How can one uh, determine just based on word counts and phrases um, if a particular, uh, let's say, narrative, um, a memoir narrative, slave narrative, belongs to the antebellum or postbellum period? So we can use this classification tool to see um, which a, any particular text belongs to. And then from that, we can get kind of as a uh, residual product of classification terms that tell us um, whether a particular text is more likely to belong to the antebellum or postbellum period. Th this is really interesting stuff to look at. We get um, certain characters or people, in, in the case of these memoirs, appearing at Nancy South, send Nancy South, Mr. Ellsworth, right, um, that, that belong probably to uh, multiple texts that are overly identified with the antebellum prior to uh, 1865 period, uh, but then we get other things, concerns with um, uh, uh, particular characters, particular places, uh, particular um, objects, right, railroad, Uncle Tom, these kinds of things are more associated with antebellum rather than uh, the postbellum period. All of this is uh, really fascinating uh, to, to think about as a way then of doing the same sort of uh, classification that we would do. I'll provide you with another example before I turn to uh, bestsellers and thinking about, about that. We can classify 18th century poetry in the same way. You can take ballads, odes, prayers, and songs, and just based on word counts, classify them and say, am I looking at here, is this particular uh, uh, lyric is this a ballad, is this an ode, is this a prayer, or a song? And you can see here with like 90% accuracy um, across this entire model, you can classify, I have like 30,000 uh, poems here uh, that, that I used in this example. And the various textual features show up as more identified with certain genres. Um, we, we see the words that belong to Old English, right, rather than the, uh, the modern English of the 18th century, uh, more identified with uh, the ode. We see Latin terms more identified with song, right, the, the origins, perhaps, of many of those. So these are all different ways of uh, categorizing texts and thinking about them. So here's the big problem. We're going to turn to thinking about bestsellers and what makes a bestseller or not using the, the same thing. And here's an object I, I love analyzing and critiquing. Um, this is Jody Archer and Matthew Jocker's The Bestseller Code. And they want to produce, using this mechanism, a way of telling whether a particular uh, text, a, a book, is going to be a bestseller or not. So just like my examples of the different genres of 18th century poetry or antebellum versus postbellum, right, uh, they want to produce classifications based on textual features of if we're going to look at a bestseller or a not bestseller text. And they claim here they're showing us data that says they can neatly separate 
based on um, these higher level features, around 2,800 uh, features, whether your book will be a bestseller or not. I'm very cranky about this particular object for a number of, of reasons, right? Um, the, I mean, for one, it's a, it's a deeply cynical project, right, uh, <laughs> for me, when we have a literary scholar trying to produce for you um, an analysis of whether a book will be a bestseller or not. The bestseller itself means very little to me. It's not a natural set, right? Iris flowers are, you know, they're, they're kind of natural. They have at least a natural distribution. I can go out into the garden and grab some flowers and say that I'm getting a sample of how these exist in the world. The bestseller, of course, is not at all natural. It's not a static category. Bestsellers change over time. When one examines the bestseller, you're not really looking at the bestseller, the text itself, even if you claim you're doing that. What you're doing is studying the market. And their, their approach, or this kind of text-based approach to it, is a rather rigidly formalist. So after this book that came out in 2016, the bestseller code, that claimed to be able to tell whether a book would be a bestseller or not, these two people uh, created a uh, consultancy called Archer Jockers, in which they sell their services to people to determine uh, whether your, as an aspiring novelist, your manuscript will be a bestseller or not. So it's a deeply cynical project coming out of this, this kind of, of work. Um, they use combinations of words to determine the likelihood of uh, a text being a bestseller or not. They turn to things and present data like character Christian Grey as having these attributes and how these attributes in a character may or may not be linked to whether your novel, your proposed novel, will be a bestseller or not. Um, in the process, they don't explain how uh, this, this came up, right? What the, are the words are that produce these higher level features? I know this might be hard for you to read, but if we take industrious, active, and likely in control as a character attribute, we have no clue where that came from. What words signify this? And why that may or may not be a bestseller text, and if that is consistently true. So they have produced from all of this a, a series of services that they'll sell to you, personalized manuscript service and analysis for $200. Um, they're providing higher level services to the book industry as well to analyze book manuscripts. Um, this is where a lot of culture is going right now, literary culture, book culture, and the, the increasing democratization of taste and of determining right, whether you should buy something or not. People are turning to like algorithmically derived results for this. And, and this kind of work is based on um, what I might call here to uh, conclude my talk, uh, big data snake oil, right? They are using textual features um, from some text to say something that's not at all natural, right? And not sharing with us their methods or their data to tell us how they categorize something as a bestseller or not. Um, this is something lots of people are concerned about, I'm deeply concerned about, and I teach courses in and think about this all the time. I give you a great book recommendation here. Kathy O'Neill's Weapons of Math Destruction takes this up, this idea of um, how algorithms are being used in decision-making processes across culture, um, to, to look at these as problems. I'm trying to link that to the book industry specifically here. Everyone claims that all their prior information biases, I agree entirely, and decisions are becoming embedded in, uh, in these models. Uh, we have to become more knowledgeable about this. This is what my book was about, trying to give us the tools to think about how, particularly with reading culture and book culture, how decision-making processes are put together, how algorithms function in these, these particular uh, tools, and how people select features. So this is uh, basically the, uh, the, the workflow, the, the way in which I constructed my argument in my, uh, in my book for analyzing and thinking about this object, the bestseller code. I would be delighted to take any, any questions about this stuff to talk with you more about where you see big data in everyday life and, and your lives um, and, and how you think uh, these tools and technologies are changing how you read and, and what you read and what you watch and what you view and what you listen to. So thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. 
Right. Yeah. There's so many fascinating things in, in what, what you're saying, right? I mean, it's, it's absolutely true. And this has been going on for a long time, right? That people can um, have gone to uh, agents and asked, right? What are you buying, right? And, and they know like genres, right? That could be interesting and exciting that, that agents and editors have lists of, uh, of what has sold. I mean, people have been producing, collecting that stuff for, for a long time. It, it's picked up um, in, in pace right, quite a bit. Um, I think there's a, there's a publishing crisis, of course, that's produced more anxiety around what is getting published and who is, you know, who's publishing, what kinds of works are being published and where they're, they're uh, being accessed. And that's intensified a, a lot of those procedures. And then we've had, I mean, this is a cultural shift, right? We believe that if, some, if a computer tells you something, it's most likely objective and true. So in the past, someone might have been a little bit more suspicious about well, really, the best-selling novels are those that feature these characters that do this thing at this particular point in time, right? And it wraps up with a happy ending and things like that. But if we get an algorithm, right, through the sort of baked-in biases, right, uh, to say something like that, then, um, then it's more, more dangerous. People are more inclined to believe it. Um, I think that models, right, for all kinds of genres exist uh, and, ha and have existed. You know, I work on memoir and autobiography, a genre I care a lot about, right? But <laughs> even your life story, when you go to represent it in text, it turns out you're following fictional models for a lot of how you think about your life and organize it, right? And, uh, it, it follows similar plots to fictional narratives. There's been a lot of really interesting theoretical work on that, too. So even when you take something that seems like a deeply personal story, you're already informed by other models of that stuff. Yes? Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think you're, you're absolutely right that uh, bestsellers are, are uh, it's a it's market feature, right? Uh, so that's, that's the thing that one should really be examining. I, I think they, they were trying to conduct an experiment because they were like literary scholars, right? Or, uh, so J Jody Archer uh, wor worked for a time as a, an editor in the publishing industry and then got a PhD in English. And I think they wanted to say that there's something about the text itself that can make it a bestseller. I think that's a mistake. Yeah, in some ways, uh, to say that, that those are properly textual features. I mean, it's probably the case with many objects, right? That the reason why we buy them has nothing to do with the content, right? With all the stuff surrounding it. That's why I wanted to get into those ways of separating or the, the metadata and object relations. I think that stuff's a little bit more important. Like, um, who blurbs, right? Who puts it in the magazine if Oprah says it's a great book, right? <laughs> there we go. It's on its way to becoming a bestseller. Um, there's various reasons why that's that's happening. I think you're absolutely right. Yes. That's not bestseller. <laughs> Yeah. 
depending on how we define the category, right, and the class of bestseller, if that is from uh, the early days of keeping bestseller lists, and that 10% could very well be gender differences, right? <laughs> if we look at the number of like, women authors, right? It, it could be something like more attached to that, though I, I would have suspicions that we can identify the gender of an author based solely on word choices, right? Um, the, the way this stuff works, right, and the way you would model an archive like this, right, take bestsellers, is you, you continually remove bestsellers from your list of bestsellers, um, and then try to test on that. Like uh, if I pull out you know, some, some recent one, like Fifty Shades of Grey, right, let's say, um, I, I then tune the model so that Fifty Shades of Grey has to be classified where I want it. That, that 2800 uh, features, set of features, were uh, produced in relation to that procedure of like taking ones out that they felt were very important to this classifying, right, system. You pull it out, you adjust your model, you put it in. So they've produced a model for us that models exactly what the bestsellers look like with maybe ten, you know, the 10% that they can't quite nail, but they got the, the texts that matter to them. And then try to say that it has predictive powers for the future. But it's derived from constantly tuning a model based on the past. And the next world historical event that happens, right, uh, will not be able to be anticipated by a model of the past, right? Do we continually want future decisions to be based in part on what we've done in the past? Probably not. We've made a whole bunch of terrible decisions in the past, right, <laughs> about various things. So if we take that idea, you know, and put it in culture broadly, right? We want to be updating the present. And you can't really do that, right, with the uh, predictive algorithm. And this has all been uh, turned into a, um, you know, a package to sell back to people. I mean, I, you know, I, I teach, right, and as, as I know you do <laughs> as well, you know, students who want to be novelists, right, want to be writers. And uh, like what I find so deeply cynical about this kind of work would be to then go to those people, right, and say, I, I know the answers, right? I know I can tell you how uh, how to achieve your dreams of being a bestseller, and that, and that, that bothers me a lot. I would say we are out of time. Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions after.